so we're going to talk a little bit about building websites using ASP.NET 4.5. And what I mean by ASP.NET 4.5 is basically the next of all the ASP.NET technologies. So um, there's some things that are going to be specific to 4.5 framework. Uh, there's other things that are out of band. So uh, you might not, you might have noticed um, as you start dealing with things, we ship Web Matrix, which is ASP or, and uh, ASP.NET Web Pages, which is the framework that um, they were showing inside of Web Matrix. Um, we ship web pages and we sh ship MVC4 and all, all those kinds of frameworks kind of out of band. We call them out of band because we're not in the main Visual Studio release or we're not in the main .NET framework release. Whereas something like web forms, which is typically in system.web, is in .NET, so we can't iterate it. Um, it's on kind of the Windows ship cycle, so we can't move um, as fastly on that. Um, fastly, I don't think that's a word. As fast on that. But we do also... Um, we, we are also moving to, a, to an ability to hopefully be able to iterate faster on those types of things. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end, but I want to kind of start off with showing you some of the, the new stuff that we're doing uh, right out of the box. So first off, this is kind of a, a diagram. It's maybe not 100% accurate. But this kind of gives you an idea of how all the ASP.NET frameworks relate to each other, right? So at the bottom, you kind of have core, um, and as you move up, you, you know, you kind of go through an abstraction and you eventually get to some HTML that you write, right? Um, so this is, this is a, a good diagram. Um, you'll see this throughout as, as we're going through the presentation. We'll kind of refer back to the diagram. So, so don't worry if you, you know, don't worry about memorizing it right now. So the first thing we want to start off talking about is core. Because um, that's really what you know, is, is the foundation, or AKA the core of ASP.NET. Um, so if we look at it, we take everything else away. This is basically what you're dealing with, right? This is system.web, if you will, with a, a few things added on. But you have modulars, handlers, uh, membership, caching, all that kind of stuff, that very low level stuff that probably most of you don't deal with on a daily basis. Most of you probably deal with one of our frameworks that's built on top of core. However, there are certain times where dealing with core is the appropriate thing. Maybe you want to hook in really, really early into the pipeline. right? So maybe uh, you want to be the first one to handle the request when it comes in because you're going to do some kind of special caching inside of your app. Um, so you want to be the first one to get, to, to get that request instead of waiting for the rest of the ASP.NET pipeline to, to fire and then kind of dealing with what you want to do. Right? Uh, so in that case, you, you may actually really want um, this kind of low-level access. Um, like I said, it, it's not, I don't envision anyone actually sitting there and writing their website in core. You can do it. You can write your own handlers, build out your own framework. I mean, if you've seen um, something like FUBU MVC, which is for you by you MVC, uh, it's an open source MVC implementation on, on top of .NET. And it basically takes ASP.NET Core and they re-implemented FUBU in their own, uh, MVC in their own way. Um, so they have an o their own pattern, and they basically did that. When they did that, they implemented basically a bunch of handlers and modules that dealt with all of that, right? So that's kind of the core foundation of everything. Uh, so we're just going to start demoing pretty quickly. And this is probably the most dead simple demo you've ever seen. So we're just going to go ahead and create empty web application. Uh, we'll call this core. Probably could have done this before while I was waiting, but that's OK. So we're going to add a class. We'll call it uh, my handler. And just so you guys get an idea, I'm just going to implement IHTTP handler. Implement the interface. Uh, for those who didn't know, control dot opens up the IntelliSense or the smart task that's there. So that little smart task that says implement interface, you can open up that up with uh, control dot. Uh, so you basically, I mean, you can see how pretty much low level it is. Uh, let me move that out of the way. You basically have is reusable, which allows, you know, tells you whether we can save the object or whether we have to create one for each request. Um, and then you have process request, right? That is probably the lowest of the low levels that you can get, which is, you know, you have a context and um, you basically have access to the request, right? So I can figure out what the user was requesting, anything out of that. Um, and then I can also modify the response if I like, right? 
So I mean, I could go as far as just doing, you know, a right line. Right, that's just gonna write that out to the response. It's not even valid HTML, but you know, you get the idea. This is the lowest of the low. Um, how many of you out there have actually implemented your own handlers at some point? Okay, so a few of you have had to. Um, it, there, there comes a time where you might find yourself needing to, but uh, for the most part, most of you don't have to worry about this. You don't have to worry about having to deal with the, the real low level. Right, so that was probably the, the lamest demo you've seen all day because it, two, two methods that you implement, IHTTP handler, you get as reusable, um, and you do with core. So uh, that's the foundation. That's kind of basically what all of our frameworks are built on top of, right? So we take these same APIs. We don't do anything really special um, to build on top of these. Most all these APIs can be exposed, um, and you can build your own. That's how something like FUBU MVC was created because they had access to all these APIs built in on top. So um, we're going to talk about Web Forms 4.5. So how many of you out there are actually using Web Forms for your app? Okay, not as many as I thought. I, I, I would have assumed that Web Forms is, is typically the, the, the way that most people choose to, to do their development. Um, and uh, so we'll, let's go ahead. And so Web Forms is continuing to evolve. It's building on top of that stack, right? So you take core and you put this abstraction on top of it, and that really helps you get your HTML, right? And Web Forms was created a while ago, um, and its main purpose was to provide a event-driven model to the web. So as we talked about in one of my previous talks, you know, the web is a disconnected nature. You ask the server for something, and the server returns it to you and doesn't remember who you are, right? Web Forms basically said, hey, we like this model of how we're developing stuff on Windows. So we like you know, the idea of having different controls. We have buttons, we have text boxes, and then in my code in the background, I can just say, hey, go grab that text box. Uh, you know, when this button is clicked, fire this event, grab this text box, you know, kind of deal with all of that. Um, and it's an abstraction on top of uh, core and on top of HTML to actually allow for that kind of model. So now that you kind of have an idea, and we'll, we'll go through a demo um, for those that may not have seen uh, web forms. Um, we'll go through a demo. But basically what uh, I want to talk about now is what we're doing for ASP.NET 4.5. So one of the big features that we've added is model binding. So how many of you are familiar with uh, MVC model binding? OK, not very many. Basically what it is is, on the server side, you have some model that represents you know, something, right? In this particular case, we're looking at one that happens to be the model of a customer. Um, and when I send that to a control, perhaps like a repeater, I want to send a list of all these customers to a repeater, and I want the repeater to do stuff for me, right? We could always do that, but we never had strong typing. It was always just kind of a list, and we had to do casting, and there was never this, this strong bind between the two. Uh, so in this particular case, the way that we've implemented it is uh, on any of your data bound controls, you can just say item type, and you give it the, the actual fully qualified name. Uh, then you can actually start using it inside of your code. It's as simple as putting uh, item first name, item last name, ID. Basically, you type item dot, and that gives you access to all the properties on your model. Second one is unobtrusive validation. So um, everyone knows that we've had required validator um, or you know regex validator or we've had all these validators for a very long time. And if we look at um, on the, the left side of the screen is basically the old way that we used to do validation. If you look at this, this is pretty pretty bad. Um, there's a lot of a lot of code there to get client side validation. A lot of uh, document dot all document dot get element. You know it's kind of nasty especially when you're considering that's a payload that you're sending down to the browser every time. So a trend that we've seen in the web, and particularly in HTML5 you know, newer experiences, is to use these things called data dash attributes. So basically what it is is a browser in the spec, in the HTML spec, it basically says any time you have an attribute that starts with data dash, anything after it, it is a valid attribute. Right? So you can kind of put these things at your free will. Right? So I could say data dash foo. 
and it would be a valid attribute doesn't mean anyone else is going to understand it or the browser is going to understand it. It's really just a marker for you to be able to find things in your HTML that you need to inside of your JavaScript. You know, so we've gone back to using things like the data dash attribute, and we'll, we'll show you that. So you can actually, um, instead of getting a bunch of, of markups fit up on your page that you might not care about, um, we, we're kind of moving to this convention that the, the web has defined already. Let's go ahead and, and demo some stuff, both web forms and um, web forms 4.5. So I have a simple site here. Uh, let me just grab my notes. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and add. Actually, I wanted to create. That's the wrong one. I'm sorry. There we go. Um, I'm just going to add a new web form. Once again, we're going to use my fancy new add web form class there. Uh, we're going to call it default, so it's just the one that runs all the time. And the first thing that you're going to notice, so another thing that we've done, so we have a, a text box, right? Everything's based on controls. Does anyone feel like they would like to know more about the, the event programming model? Or is everyone pretty familiar with how this works? Sounds like everyone's familiar. Yeah, Webforms has been out for a while, so uh, we won't waste time going through a demo of that. Um, uh, so we're going to give this um, an ID, and then we're going to do the, the standard run at attribute, which uh, tells ASP.NET that this needs to be available on the server. Basically, we need to serialize it and keep track of it. Um, and then, so previously, we've always had text mode. And basically, what this allowed you to do is in HTML, there's two different elements. There's, you know, text input, text password, there's text area, well, more than two. There's several of these different types. There's uh, different types of inputs, or even, you know, text area is a whole new element. Um, so in 4.5, we've actually gone ahead and added all of the different new input types that have been added in HTML5. So we have support for uh, color, date, time, date, time, locale, email. You know, you can go through and, and look at all of these. But there's a significantly large amount of these that have been added, um, which is going to be great when browsers start supporting them. Um, browsers are still hit or miss of whether they support it. But you can imagine how much time it's going to save you if all you have to do is say, hey, um, this is now a date. You don't have to do anything else. You just mark it as a date. Uh, you're good to go. You get a little nice date picker, right? You don't have to go worry about hooking up jQuery uh, UI with a date picker. It's going to save you a lot of time. Uh, so anyways, we've, we've added those in there for you now. Uh, so all those are there. And then like any good control or any good web forms app, We're going to go ahead and add a button. We're going to give it an ID of DTN submit. We're going to do the fancy run at. Um, one thing that I want to point out, this is like a little victory for me when I notice this. It's also a little embarrassing. Uh, if you notice, as I was pressing equal, I got the uh, quote uh, inserted for me, and my cursor moved into the front. Um, in Visual Studio 2010, you used to have to type the first quote, and then we would add the second quote for you. Um, and I was really excited once I found out about this, that this feature was there, because it's going to save me you know, one little character press the whole time. Um, except you know, I got up and I, I did a presentation, and this was super awesome, and I was so excited about it. And then I had somebody come to me at the end of the presentation and say, we added that feature in Visual Studio 2010 SP1. No idea it existed. It's a feature that you can go set in Tools Options. I'll show you where it's at if you're wondering. Um, but that was a little bit of an embarrassing moment that I had been dealing with this for so long and didn't know that it existed. Uh, and then obviously, um, we're an event-driven uh, web application, so I want to do something with this text box that I have. Actually, let me give it a value first, just so we um, have something to look at when we run the page. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to do on-click. Uh, too much. OK. How many of you have seen this feature before? This is a feature of Visual Studio 11. So previously, when we did on click, you used to have to type in your, your own, uh, you know, delegate name. You'd go out, wire it up yourself, or you could open up the designer um, and you know, double click on the button, and we'd wire it up the the thing for you. And that's pretty much a uh, confession. Is that's the only time I really opened up the designer was to do these kind of tasks, like where I wanted to hook up a button, um, or you could hook it up through the properties window. But now we have this uh, really cool feature with uh, the smart tasks. So. All of the smart tasks that are previously available in the designer window are now available in the code window. Right? So create new event is available. I can just go ahead and press enter. 
And if I zoom back out here so you can see, it's gone ahead and created an event, uses the, the object, or the uh, ID it gave me, and then it's also open, opened up my code behind back here and created a nice event for me, right? That's super handy, um, but you can imagine on data controls or something like that that might have uh, open up data binding, open up the data source dialog, all that stuff is now available from the, um, from the code file itself. And you'll notice you basically get this little icon in front it says, hey, um, I, I can do something, right? In this particular case, I, I don't have the closing tag, so it's not very happy. Um, but if I come back to here, they're available on every attribute. So we, we have the smart task there, and you can open up those with control dot as well. Um, and we've even put them on other, you know, all the HTML elements, so you can actually, if you want to build Visual Studio controls, you can create your own smart tasks um, that'll hook into, say, form or something. Uh, so that's going to save you a little bit of time. So let's go ahead and just run this page. Let's build and run. What is it complaining about? Oh, I thought I built. Oh, oops, I totally, how did I do that? That's awesome. Thank you for the people in the crowd who keep telling me what I'm doing wrong. Let's just do that again. Okay. All right, so this is great. I have a text box, you know, I can type in it. If I was actually doing something about, you know, worthwhile, I could type in it. But let's say I wanted to write some HTML, right? So I want to do something like, hello world. I'm just gonna copy this so I have it for later. How many people know what's gonna happen when I click submit here? A couple people, not, not very many. If I go ahead and click submit, ta-da, ASP.NET says, we're gonna try to protect you. So built in, we have what's called request validation. And we'll look at things that we think should just be text or numbers, and we'll say, no, that's a potentially dangerous request. Somebody is trying to post HTML to your page, right? Because, uh, you know, when, when Web Forms was created, you know, posting HTML wasn't necessarily something you did, right? You, you typed in your comment, you uploaded it, it was great. Typically, when you were trying to upload HTML is when you were trying to hijack a site. So you were trying to maybe upload a script tag and get the script tag to show up in, in the comments so you could then hijack a user session and do things, right? Um, so we kind of protect you for this. Um, and previously, in other versions of ASP.NET, um, you basically had, in, in way older versions, you basically had to turn validation off for the entire site, which is a bad thing. So think about this as basically, I'm, I'm writing a blog, uh, blog engine. And uh, I want my users who are actually creating blog posts to be able to write HTML. Previously, I would have to turn it off for the whole site. That was kind of horrible. In newer versions, we allowed you to turn it off per page, right? So you could go into just the page that was create new blog posts and say, hey, I don't want request validation. Go ahead and turn that off for this page. So, um, but still that left you open, especially if you had lots of forms, maybe you accidentally added that to something and it was being rendered around, right? It wasn't the greatest. So we've taken that one step further in 4.5. So if I come into this um, uh, text box here, let me just scroll over so you guys can see, and I can say validate request mode and I can specifically disable it for this single text box. So this single piece of information, I'm gonna build, I'm gonna run the site I get the standard, you've already submitted this form, are you sure you want to? And if I go ahead and paste this in now, you can see that it, it's okay, right? You don't get ASP.NET yelling at you saying, hey, you can't post HTML. Uh, so this is something that's, that has been plaguing us for a while, right? Uh, and we added this feature because we want you to have a s more secure site, right? We don't want you to just have to turn things off on and off on a, on a whole page basis, right? We want you to have very granular control over what you're saying you can and can't do on your site. Let me just check my demos here. Okay, so then let's go ahead and uh, go one step further. So we talked about unobtrusive validation, so let me just go ahead and add a required field validator. 
Uh, that's totally not the event that I wanted. Uh, let's just call that. And then let's say run at, do the standard run at server. Uh, control to validate is, I believe we called it uh, text box name. Let's give it a message. Right, so this should just go ahead and work. So if I go ahead and run this site, apparently I didn't keep it open. So I've got this great. Uh, don't mind the fact that the, there's a little space there. That's because the element's actually there. Uh, so if I just want to go ahead and submit this and I want the form to be to show up, I'm going to get this nice error. Right? And this error is actually telling us what we need to fix. So by default, we've turned on unobtrusive validation. Right? So the thing that I was talking about, data dash, we've turned that on by default for you because right? uh, we think it's going to be better for you. So you get this nice error that says, hey, web forums, unintrusive validation requires this uh, script resource mapping for jQuery. Right? So that's because the ASP.NET team is taking a dependency on jQuery to do unobtrusive validation. Right? These libraries already existed for doing unobtrusive validation before we came along, so we didn't think it was right to go write our own, reinvent the wheel. Let's just take advantage of one that's already there. And luckily, um, because I know about NuGet, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go to manage NuGet packages. If I just click on my local feed and I search for uh, script manager, I'm just going to go ahead and install uh, script manager.jQuery. Um, I'm going to accept the terms. And this is actually going to install, and it's going to do everything that we actually need it to do for us. It's going to set up the right references. So if I go ahead and close this, build. And run. Right now, you can see it just automatically worked. And if we go ahead and inspect this element, right, you can see data dash. You know the function that we're using to evaluate it, all that good stuff. Right, we're we're not um, inserting a bunch of JavaScript into your page that may or may not be valid or that's a couple years old. Um, and the only reason, to to be clear, you're not going to have to do that every time you create a site. Um, by default, the new project templates will come with pre-installed NuGet packages, and we're going to talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, this, um, the reason why I had to do it here is I said empty website when I created the website, so I made sure there was nothing inside of it, no packages or anything else installed. So typically, you won't have to do that. I just wanted to illustrate the fact that we're taking advantage of those um, already written libraries. Okay, and the last thing that I wanted to show um, it's more around the tooling feature, but this is really helpful, especially if you do a lot of web forms uh, development. Who, who here has written, uh, wrote some kind of, some piece of code and said, hey, this would be really good as a user control? So then you, you, know, you cut it out, created a new user control, added it. Uh, well, with Visual Studio um, 11, we've actually added a right click, extract as user control. It's going to open up a dialog. It's going to ask me where I want to save it. We go through the time. We register them up there. We also will look at your web config. If you're registering your user co controls in your web config, we'll follow that convention rather than uh, doing it at the top. Same with the naming convention, all that. Um, so that should actually save you a bunch of time, especially if you're uh, an avid web forms developer um, who's writing a bunch of code and then you know kind of wants to refactor it into usable controls. Currently in the beta, it does not. Um, I cannot promise that it's going to for the next. So the question for the people online was, does it actually extract the event handlers as well? Uh, right now, uh, the answer is no. The, sh the short answer is no. Uh, it's definitely a bug that we have open. I can't promise that it's going to. Um, it's definitely something that we understand would be the right thing to do. Um, it's just a, a matter of time. Okay. Any more questions on the web form stuff? So let's talk about web pages. So web pages is our kind of simplicity story, right? So if you look at what we had before, we had previously um, core, which is very low level, probably not what you want to write a website in. Then we had web forms, which is you know still rather complex. There's a lot of events. You have to understand how an event model works. Then we came out with MVC. It's a great pattern. But we had nothing for, let's say, the developer coming right out of college. 
or you know, mom and pop that just wants to create a nice simple site. You can think of something like PHP, right? I'll be honest. We had we had nothing that was a comp you know an answer to PHP, right? So we took a long hard look at this and um, we developed web pages, which um, that's a marketing people's name. I don't know why we called it web pages because that's not confusing at all. I develop web pages in web pages. Um, so, anyways, um, it's basically HTML plus Razor syntax punch plus a bunch of helpers. Um, so, if you're familiar with Razor syntax, either from MVC, probably from MVC, the, the new view engine, which we'll talk about, the Razor syntax was actually born inside of web pages. This is where we started writing it. We said, hey, we want this kind of functionality. We want it to look like this. We want it to be super simple to switch back and forth um, between code and markup. And then uh, we started writing it. We said, hey, this would be great if we could just have it everywhere. So then we kind of pulled it out. And um, that's why it's in, in uh, NBC as well. So let's give you an idea of the Razor syntax. Right, so like I said, it's a fluid way to move between markup and code. Right, so in this particular case right here, where I wanted to say, hey, if this value is true, I want you to, out to print out this piece of code, right? this piece of markup onto my page. Um, previously, in other versions of ASP.NET, you would have to put what I like to call the bumblebee. It was the, uh, the less than percent sign. And if you look at it, because it's yellow, it kind of looks like a bumblebee flying around with a little stinger. Um, so we call it open bumblebee, close bumblebee. Um, previously, you used to have to put those everywhere. Every time you wanted to put code, you'd have to put one of those, right? That's a lot of markup. When we should be able to understand, we being the framework, should understand what's code and what's not, right? It's pretty simple. There's, turns out, well, it turns out it's not terribly simple. It's actually kind of complex, but we can do that work for you, right? We can make that better. So this was our attempt to basically allow you to fluidly switch in between markup and code. So there's a couple ways that you can kind of move back and forth. So what you'll see here is the at open mustache curly brace thing. This is a code block. This is basically defining, hey, inside of here, this is code, right? Um, so that's how you would do it. Anytime you do at, it defines, hey, this is code, or this is a variable name. You know, there's some, some different stuff that will show you when you can use that. But basically, this is a code block up here on the screen. And I want to define this variable, and then I want to spit it out in some HTML. And what we do here is when we see you start writing HTML tags, we have an understanding of HTML. So when we see you writing HTML tags, we say, hey, you probably meant that to be just outputted onto the screen. Let's go ahead and do that for you. But then when we see the at sign again, we say, hey, that meant you probably want to go back into code, right? So you can um, write an HTML block that way. The second way is with a text block. So you could basically come through here, and if you want to write out something and you're inside of a code block, and you want to print out some kind of text, you don't want it to be HTML. So maybe you're inside of an attribute, or um, you've already got a HTML around it. You can actually use this escape function. We kind of provided this as a, as a way for you to get out. So if, if you don't want to write HTML, and we're kind of confused because there's a lot of uh, code around there, you can use this text to always basically say, hey, I want to write this to the page. Right? And then the last way is a single line of markup. Uh, this is pretty self-explanatory. You can basically say, print this out, and here's the value. Pretty simple. Uh, you're just basically, this is the inline syntax for something like this. So let's go ahead and jump to some demos on web pages. So the other thing with web pages is because they're simple, we wanted you to basically be able to create a CSHTML file anywhere and host it. Right? And that kind of scenario basically lends itself to being an old school website, not a web application or project. So we're actually going to say file new website. Uh, Brady showed you how to do that in WebMatrix. WebMatrix creates all the websites, and you can launch into Visual Studio. In this case, I'm just going straight from Visual Studio. And I can say, hey, I just want to create an ASP.NET website. And the Razor v2 syntax, or v1 syntax, means this is, um, is going to be a, a web pages app. So in this particular case, I'll choose V2. Uh, let's go ahead and save that. Let me just steal some code here. Make sure that I have. Uh, 
Uh, apparently wants to install a bunch of stuff, so uh, pardon the interruption while this goes. This is actually a feature. Um, you get paid to do nothing while Visual Studio is doing this, so if you create a lot of projects, we're really trying to help you. Let me just uh, create a new. So I'm going to add a new item. Inside of here, you can see we have a bunch of stuff. In this particular case, I'm just going to create a new CSHTML file, and I'm going to call it demo. Right? Uh, so this fluid change between markup and code might be a little bit easier to see inside of Visual Studio, because we give you nice colorization. The colorization doesn't really translate well to slides. Uh, so we'll spend some time kind of showing you that. Uh, the first thing is, you know, we have the same kind of concept as, as um, all the rest of our frameworks where you have some kind of layout page or a master page uh, where you have some kind of stuff around the outside with content, right? So we can go ahead and set that. And uh, in this particular case, this is called site layout. And Brady touched a little bit on the, the nice routing options that we have. So we have some conventions in there. Um, I think we codenamed them at one point Smarty Routes. I don't know that that's actually the name uh, because they have a lot of built-in smarts. Um, but one of the, the smarts that it has built in is actually if you start underscore, the file name with underscore, you can actually not navigate to it. You can use it inside of a page like this for site layout, but you can actually just request that page physically. Um, that's why app start is underscore, uh, site layouts underscore, those types of things. So if you find yourself needing to prevent that site, you know, page from being accessed, just put underscore in front of it. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and set the, the layout. And then I'm just going to, to give myself some code here. And this variable name. right? And you can kind of see the highlighting. Uh, hopefully all you can see this highlighting. It's a, it's a little different because it's, it's white on gray, so it's not, or gray on white. It's not the greatest. But you can see that we're highlighting things in gray. That keys us in that we're in code. Right? So when I come down here and I say, hey, I just want to create a paragraph. And I'm going to say, hello. And I want to say my variable name, which is, you know, name. I just do this, right? And you can see here, if we just make sure we're zoomed in, hopefully that helps being able to see. Uh, you can see we're just, you know, color, colorized just like regular HTML. And then all of a sudden we hit this little code block, the at symbol, where we define the variable, right? And then we, we cut off and we do dot, dot, dot at the end. We go back to being in code. Right, because we are into markup. We started off in markup, so we go back to being in markup. Uh, and if I just run this page, right, very simple. You can see it works. Nothing, you know, nothing too magical. The other way, uh, let me just look here. So let's say I wanted to come into here and I want to do an if statement. So if, and I'm just going to, in this particular case, I'm not going to make it too exciting. We're just going to say if true. And then I want to print something out onto the page. So I have two options. The first option is I could say if paragraph tag right, works. If I click up here, you can see the colorization where it got to the code statement, and it's the curly braces opening, and then it's, then it's switching back to markup. Right? We switch back to markup. We switch to HTML. Um, and then we'll switch back to code for that closing curly brace. Right, so this would work just fine. If I come over here, run the site, you're going to see it's, hey, works, that's great. Let's say, uh, for whatever reason, I wanted to have the paragraph tag outside. So I wanted to do something like this. Right, this is not terribly, you know, this, this isn't going to work, because what, what does work mean? It doesn't know that you want to outprint it. Like I said, we have the, uh, escape function, so we can just do text. And let's just go ahead and do text there. If I go ahead and run this, paragraph ta tag is outside of it. Text basically says, hey, just render it out to the, to the outside. Uh, check my notes. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about the Razor syntax and how we know when to switch back and forth? How many of you knew about Razor and knew the syntax already? OK, so a couple of you. So, so some of you learned something. That's good. So, And then I want to show you a little bit more of a complex page. right? These are all kind of relatively simple examples. So I want to show you a little bit more of a complex page. 
Um, and these are the, the default project templates, and we'll um, talk more about those later. But we already have a login page created. So kind of the way these things work is you typically have a block of code at the top, and then you have your markup. Great, so I have a very simple, if I skip down to here, I have a very simple page that's you know, nothing more than some login. In this particular case, I'm actually supporting OAuth, so we have a form, um, and we have some stuff. You can see here we can do uh, server-side comments, so these comments aren't gonna be sent down to the client by doing uh, at star, uh, which is kinda nice. Uh, you can comment your markup a little bit nicer and not have to worry about that actually being in the markup that's sent down. Um, and you can see we're using different validation helpers. Um, w one of the things with web pages is we have lots of helpers. We have helpers for pretty much everything. Um, and if we don't have the helper, somebody's probably written it for, and it's uh, available on NuGet. Um, so there's not a whole lot you have to do yourself, which is kind of nice. I like not doing work. Um, and then you can kind of see here, we have a very uh, simple um, kind of layout in the code. We say, you know, this is the stuff that runs all the time. And then we have this nice, you know, if this is a post, so if it's a post request, we have this variable is post. It says, hey, if it's posting, you know, it'll be true. Um, so if you posted something on the form, actually go through, and then we can kind of look through it. This is kind of the, the stereotypical example of what a web pages page will look like, right? There's some code block, and then there's probably a do a bunch of stuff, and then if it's a post, do a bunch of stuff to validate it, make sure it's okay, and then redirect, you know, so, hey, if, it, if it's fine, or my account's locked out, or, you know, hey, um, I'm gonna, I can go ahead and redirect, right? So this is, this is kind of the, the standard look and feel. Any questions? No? Okay. Moving on. So that was a crash course in web pages. Um, very simple, and I think the coolest thing about web pages is the razor syntax, right? Uh, it's really fluid. Once you start using it, you really don't want to go back, um, especially when you start using it with MVC um, or, or other um, stuff that you, you've been using Razor for a while and you try to come back, you're like, this is painful to have to go through and type all these bumblebees all over the place. Uh, so it's a really nice syntax. So kind of the third piece of the puzzle, if you will, is MVC, right? So it's just another choice. It's another framework, right, on top of ASP.NET Core, right? So um, MVC stands for Model View Controller. It's kind of a theory to define how you write your code, right? You have a model, which is your data. You have the controller, which is basically takes the input and figures out what it wants to do with it. And you have a view that's in charge of uh, presenting that, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a pattern that's been around since the beginning of computer science almost. It's, it's a very common pattern, but it works very well on the web. So, um, how many of you are using MVC today, or have used it? Okay, so that's a, that's a good portion of you. I'm really glad to see that. Um, so what does it look like for those that haven't? Basically, a request comes into the server, and the controller sees it. So the, the controller is given the request. There are some heuristics about how a controller gets its request, and we'll cover those. The controller gets its request and does stuff. So the first thing it does is it says, hey, what model am I looking for? I need to go find the model and I need to do whatever it is I need to do, whether it be some calculations on that model, whether it's populating that model, whatever it may be. And then I take that model, and I find the view that's associated with this model. So I say, hey, um, this user wants this page, uh, it's the person model, and it's the person view over here. I'm gonna pass the model to the view, and then the view is gonna go through and say, hey, I've got a model to work with, right? It's basically just dumb data. You pass. Very, very simple data. You don't pass access to a database to a view. You pass the, you know, the first name, the last name, you know, the ID, all that kind of stuff to the view. The view, you know, figures out what kind of HTML it needs to do, makes it, you know, nice and pretty looking, uh, and then sends everything back to the client. Right? It's a very nice way to separate the concerns of your site. Right? In fact, that's that's one of the reasons many people choose us is it's separation of concerns. So you can take your controller, which is kind of your business logic. You can move that out, you can test that. You can take your model logic, put it someplace else, test all your model logic, so you know, if I have a first name, I must have a last name, you can move all that out and test all of that. And then you can have your view, and that's very simple. 
you know, for, for lack of a better term, dumb HTML that just takes some values and puts values into the right places, right? All very simple and testable, right? Instead of one big app all coming together. So with that, uh, one of the things that we've really worked on in MVC uh, 3 tools, up, or MVC 3 and MVC 4, is supporting dependency injection. Um, if you don't know what it is, you probably don't need to worry about it yet. Dependency injection is just a way for you to uh, insert dependencies into your code such that it can make it more testable. And if we go through the list, uh, there's quite a few dependency injection points. So uh, you can go through uh, model binders, value providers, validation providers, model metadata providers. And what all this does is allows you uh, to insert mocks or fake faked out versions of these things so you can easily test your code. Right? Uh, so we have quite a few and there's more coming. Um, no promises on anything, but we, you know, we are listening to the community about where um, we need more supported uh, dependency injection points as well. So let's go ahead and do a quick demo of MVC4. Go ahead and close this. So I'm going to do file new project, and I'm going to choose MVC4 here. I'm going to run it. So I want to stop and talk a little bit about this. Um, I, I just want you to remember this dialog for later. So just think about this dialog. But you can notice here one of the first things with MVC4 is we've given you a lot of good choices. So we've created lots of different starting points for you, right? We have this internet application. We have intranet application. We have a mobile web API. Uh, single page application or just empty, right? So we presented you with lots of different choices to start out with. And this is one of the things that we have done. Um, one of the, the big things in MVC3 and we're building on it in MVC4 is to, to kind of give you these better starting points um, as you get going. Uh, so if I say internet application, I can also choose the view engine that I want. So Razor is the new view engine. That's based on the Razor syntax that we just so showed. And then the old view engine is the ASPX view engine or web forms view engine. That's based on the syntax that's based in web forms. So that's the thing with all the bumblebees. Right, so you can pick or choose right there. Uh, so let's go ahead and say we want Razor. And then um, because MVC is about separation of concerns, I want to go ahead and add a unit test project. Um, and I can choose the test framework that I want. Um, you can get information about installing different test frameworks. So if you don't like Visual Studio unit test, you want to use XUnit. Um, you can install some stuff, XUnit can plug into this, so then you'll get an XUnit project instead of a Visual Studio project. I'm going to go ahead and create um, this application. So it's going to take a few seconds here, and I'll explain why later. But if you notice, in the, f um, in the Solution Explorer, we have a couple folders that might look new to you. Right? So we have a Models folder, we have a Views folder, and we have a Controllers folder. Right? That directly correlates to you know, MVC, right? model views controllers. Um, so this is your standard MVC site. I'm just going to go ahead and um, not worry about this, what's already scaffolded or what's already created. Um, let's go ahead and create a new one. So the first place I want to start off with is I'm going to create a new model. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say add class. And uh, the first thing, uh, like any good demo, is probably a person. Right, so we're going to go ahead and say person. And I think I have the code for this already, so I don't have to type it all out. Just make life a little bit easier here. Right. Uh, so I have an ID, right? That's customer ID or, or whatever, you know, social security number, whatever you want to call it. You have an ID, a person, a first name, and a last name. Pretty simple. I'm going to go ahead and build this uh, just so that model is already populated. The next thing that I want to do is I want to add a controller, right? So I've got the model. Now I uh, want the controller to be able to grab that model and do something with it. So I'm going to say add controller. If you right click on the controllers, uh, you can actually see that we have uh, um, add controller or there's your shortcut for it. Right? So one thing you'll notice with MVC is there's a lot of really cool tooling built around it. right? Because there's a lot of these conventions, a lot of stuff that you may have to go create. And we said, hey, let's make that easier for you. So we have a lot of built-in tooling. Uh, so in the controller, we're going to say, OK, give me the controller. Uh, what do I want to call this? I'm going to call this the people controller, right? Pluraliz pluralization of person. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to change this to I want to create a controller with read-write actions using Entity Framework. Right? Uh, and I'll explain. Basically, I want to be able to create people, remove people, edit people. 
right? It's kind of the idea. Um, and I'm going to use Entity Framework as the data store behind all of that, right? Um, that's kind of the, the way that we subscribe that you, you do that. And then also I pick a model class, so the controller says, hey, which, which model do you want to use? In this particular case, I have the person. This is why I had to build, because we look at all the uh, classes that you have inside of your application, and we'll figure out which ones are suitable for um, being models. And then the data context, this is related to EF. Uh, if you're not familiar, don't worry about it. Um, but it's basically, I am also allowed to just create uh, data context from here as well. So I'm just going to give it demo data context. It's going to create it. Um, I want my views to be razor views. Um, and you'll see why in just a second. So when I do this, this is going to go off and do a lot of cool stuff for me. Right? It's actually not only going to create the controller, but it's going to create the entity uh, framework code that I need to store things. And it's also going to create a bunch of views. So I have my people controller that I just scaffolded. But if we go down to the views folder, you can see that we have all the views associated with this. And MVC is very related to conventions. In the particular case, the convention is you have a you know, something controller. So in this case, we have a people controller. So under the views folder, it's going to look for views that match. And it's going to look under the people folder inside of that, because that's the name of the controller. Remove controller from it, and that's the name. So it's going to look underneath the people folder. And then what it's going to look for, how it matches a view to um, an action, which these are basically actions. So these are actions uh, on the controller. It's basically just an entering point. So it's where thing, you know, a request comes in and a, request go and a response comes out from. That's an action. Um, and it matches based on the name. So in this particular case, this when we hit this action, we're going to look for a view called index underneath the people folder, which is right here, so it would be immediately served back up. Right? And if I just go ahead and run this site, make sure I build to so I had all the controller added, everything correctly. I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to go to people. And it's probably going to, oh, I forgot to do one thing. Sorry. This is a bug in the build I have. Um, normally, you don't have to do this. Uh, it's just an issue in the, the build of Visual Studio that I'm running. Don't man mind the man behind the curtain. So go ahead and run this, and I go to people. Uh, it's going to take a second because actually what it's doing is it's creating a database. Entity Framework is going off and creating a database in the background for me. That's why that first request took a little bit because uh, the database hadn't been created. And I can do a simple very create new, you know, Matthew Osborne, create, right? So this is uh, a simple scaffolding. It gives you an idea of, you know, how MVC works and what we're doing. Uh, so MV MVC4, um, we're doing a lot of improvements around dependency injection, along with uh, some other things we'll talk about later. But one of the things with MVC that's most prevalent is if we jump back to, let me just close some of these windows before we get out of control. If we jump back to the slides, one of the things that's most prevalent with MVC4 is that we're now including Web API. So Web API um, was a product that was released out of band. And it was originally outside of MVC, right? And we took a look at it and we said, hey, this is, you know, two different teams at Microsoft were creating, you know, one team was creating Web API, another team was creating MVC. We said, hey, these things are very similar. Um, they're really almost the same thing. Let's go ahead and create them together. There's no need for us to, um, you know, have these two different things and confuse a bunch of people, right? Uh, so a lot of work has been bringing in Web API into MVC4, so you just automatically get it. That's why you saw a, uh, uh, web API project there um, created. And um, the idea is Web API kind of adds this last little bit layer um, that's left in the diagram. The idea here is um, when I'm building a site, how do I reach other platforms and devices? Right? So my goal here is to create a RESTful HTTP interface. Right? Uh, so I want to create an API. Everyone's heard of the Twitter API, the Facebook API, right? I want other people to be able to access the data and the information that's stored on my site, or even upload data and information to my site, right? And I want them to be able to easily do that in a, in a programmable way, um, regardless of what framework they choose to write their application in, right? Um, 
creating a web API is probably the best out of the box. Um, we have support for JSON and XML. Um, we provide custom formatters. There'll be more custom formatters that come in the form of NuGet packages later. Um, but I'm not going to steal. So we, we have a simple demo here, and I'm just going to run over it. But I'm not going to go too in depth, because the talk right after this is about web API, and I don't want to steal all of Brady's content. So we'll just. Um, go over this quickly. Um, it's basically just a way, it looks very similar to an MVC controller. You just create a web API controller. So I still have a model. I added this web API controller. Um, and then very simply, I can say, hey, uh, I have an action. I want to return information from that. Um, and then all of that just happens, right? It provides XML or JSON based on uh, when someone issues the request, they say, hey, I want a JSON version of this. Uh, we'll serialize the person object, all of that good stuff. Um, like I said, I don't want to steal his thunder on this, so I'm going to kind of skip halfway th quickly through all that. Um, we'll just skip that slide because he's going to cover it as well. And the demo. Okay. So, with the last little bit, I want to talk about oneaspn.net, right? Uh, oneaspn.net to rule them all, one to bind them. Any Lord of the Rings folks? No? Okay. Um, apparently, I'm the only geek in the room. So, well, with this, if you saw the project, it looks very daunting. If you saw that diagram of, all, of how everything works together, right? So there's web forms, there's core, there's web pages, there's MVC. One of the problems we're facing now is we, as we've created all these frameworks is that it's very daunting to a new user, right? When you come in and create an application, what do I choose? Do I have to choose web forms? Do I have to choose web API? What do I do, right? Well, realistically, because they're all built on core, they can all exist together in one big happy family, right? In theory, and I have a, a complete talk about this subject, is that I can take web forms and put MVC inside of it, and they can coexist together. And a perfect example of a site that coexists web forms and MVC is CodePlex. CodePlex still has a lot of code that's running in web forms, but they're new stuff they use in MVC. So the idea here is that the, the message that I want to get across to everyone is that you don't have to choose just MVC. You don't have to choose just web pages. You don't have to choose just web forms. You can pick one and then add all the other ones in there with you. right? So I'll spend just a few seconds talking about this. And I want you to know that um, what we're going to talk about is very prototype. Uh, it's just being under development, it's not necessarily going to happen. It's in later bits. So don't, I, I just want to give you an idea of where we are going to try to help make ASP.NET more approachable for you, right? Because it kind of sucks that as soon as you create a file new project, you have to make a choice. Or you have to make a technology choice as soon as you fi say file new project. That's really not the greatest. So uh, this is an example of what file new project looks like today. So if I say file new project and I want to go to the web, I have all of these choices for a bunch of ASP.NET stuff that I want to create. Right? There's a lot of stuff. I'm immediately presented with a choice. Um, well, is, is a web application, is web forms the right thing for me? Is that the right thing for my company? Is MVC the right thing for my company? Because you know, once I click this button, there's no going back. Right? Once I've invested in it, there's no going back. Well, that's wrong. Right? I just told you that's wrong. But that's what this dialogue makes people feel. A right? lot of choices really quickly. So this is something, like I said, that may come in v.next.next.next.next. I don't know when this is going to come. But this is some discussions that we're having on the internal discussions that we're having on the ASP.NET team to, to, to try to understand and make these types of things better for you. Uh, so what you're about to see, don't count on it being anywhere. Um, it is rather new. I think it's only been shown twice to the public. So um, in this particular case, this is what we want file new project to look like. Right? We want you to say file new project, and then you just have ASP.NET web application. Right? You don't have to worry about, am I choosing the MVC framework? Am I choosing the web pages framework? Am I choosing uh, you know, just a straight HTML page? Am I creating a web API site? I don't want to have to choose that right from the beginning. Right? That's not how a company works. That's not how people work. Right? They come in and they say, hey, I want to do this, and MVC is great for it. And then, hey, I want to add this API, so this web API thing is great for it. Hey, I want to write a down and dirty, quick, simple admin, so maybe I want to use web forms. Right? This, is, this is how people work. We, don't, we want to make it easy for you. Right? You're not presented with a 1,000 choices immediately. 
And this is absolutely for illustration purposes only. This might not be what it looks like. When you click File New, ASP.NET Web Application, we want to pop up something that looks similar to this dialog. This was kind of hacked together, and we actually have a, a rough demo of this working, but it's really hacky code, just kind of all hacked together um, into some very, very unstable bits. That's why I don't show it most of the time, because I don't want to have those bits installed. Basically, when you say File New Project, we want to present you with this window that says, hey, um, what do you want to do? Do you want to choose SignalR? Do you want to choose uh, internet, uh, uh, intranet application, a regular application, MVC site, a web form site? What do you want to choose? Or you might be saying to yourself, how is this any different than that one page, right? The, the page before with all the choices. Well, the difference here is that these are checkboxes. I can say, hey, I want web forms. Hey, I want MVC. Hey, I want web API. Hey, I want SignalR. Right, they're choices. You get to build up your app. They're Lego blocks. Right, you hear Scott Hansman talk a lot about how Lego blocks, all of these things kind of fit together to build this really nice site for yourself. Right? So we want to have something that looks very similar to this that allows you to actually go through and pick and choose the right pieces that you want for your application. Then lastly, we have, so, so what happens? I made my choice. I've said, go ahead and create my site with uh, MVC. What happens if I say, oh crap, I actually wanted Web API as well? Do I just have to start from the beginning? No. So we want to provide the ability later for you to add on these things anytime you want. So you can be happy. You can go create your website in MVC. And then when you become hugely popular, which you all will, and you say, hey, I want to create an API for people to access my data, right? then you can come back in and run this install package, install MVC or uh, install Web API, and get the right bits, and we set up the right project, and then you can start adding that Web API. Instead of having to create a new project, fiddle with how the different projects are going to fit together, um, or worry about it that way. We, want, we all want this all to work together, um, and be able to install them via NuGet is the kind of the way that we're assuming. We're taking heavy dependence on NuGet. So, like I said, keep in mind there's some, there's some very heavy technical issues with that vNext goal that we have, um, but it's something we're looking into. But I did want to show you a few things that we're kind of doing to help bring uh, one ASP.NET together, kind of the message together as well. So I keep promising that we're going to actually talk about the project templates. So here's when we're actually going to talk about the project templates. So this is what the new project templates look like. Right, um, they have a, a you know kind of a standard three column layout, um, you know some bulleted lists, a nice call to action. I can click around the about page, view some information. Um, you know I can log in, register. We have all that kind of hooked up for you. Uh, we've taken it a step further. If you remember from my HTML5 talk when we were talking about CSS3 um, media queries, so take a look at what it looks like, and then as I shrink the page, we kind of get a more adaptive rendering. Uh, so the layout kind of changes, makes it a little bit nicer for you, uh, especially if you scroll down to something like a phone that might have a uh, scroll, right? It's kind of tedious to scroll through a lot. So we do things like remove images, those types of things when you're on an even smaller screen. Um, and, you know, we do things like make a little buttons a little bit slightly bigger so they're easier to click. We add a little bit more padding here and there to make everything easier to click as well. But the cool thing here about making this a one ASP.NET message is now all of our frameworks have this same template, right? It was normally the case where, you know, a new version of MVC would come out and it would have the latest and greatest template, right? It would look the best, and then you would open up web forms and it would kind of be this outdated look and feel. Or, you know, hey, new version of web forms came out. Web forms has the greatest and latest template, and then all of a sudden, you know, all of our uh, MVC templates look outdated, right? So we've actually taken the time to align them all properly so you actually get an idea of how to do all of this together. And the cool thing about that is that if you're a web forms developer and you understand how to do logins and, uh, you know, contact pages and forgot passwords, you know how to do that in web forms, but you want to learn how to do that in MVC, right? Because you can look at the web forms and say, oh, this is how it translates to an MVC app, right? And then we also start you, with, start you off with good markup as well. Um, and then along those lines of 1ASP.NET, if we go ahead and manage NuGet packages, if I just go ahead and click on the Install tab, 
you can see that we have a lot of packages already installed. We rely very heavily on NuGet for pre-installed NuGet. Uh, we, we have a feature called pre-installed NuGet packages in a template, which um, allows us to do things like ship the ASP.NET MVC runtime. Right, so I, if a new version of ASP.NET comes out, I can go to NuGet and update it. Now, that's a little bit of a caveat because that means my site will have all the new features, but I might not have the new tooling because there's a tooling part to MVC as well. Same with Razor. Uh, but it means that I can just go in here, update this, and I don't have to spend all the time, especially if, you're, if you work with betas a lot, you might realize, hey, I've created this really cool app, uh, a new version came out of MVC, now I've gotta go through and figure out what I have to convert. Right, that's kind of annoying. Now you can just go into NuGet and update it um, as well. So I go ahead and zoom out. So you can see how we're kind of trending to make this, you know, really simple for everyone. And to be able to add, basically, you know, what is it? I think it's uh, Wendy's is have it your way in the United States. There's a, a fast food joint that has a slogan called have it your way. Right, that's kind of what we're looking for. Let's go back to the slides. So there's one last thing to all of this, which is the web stack. So web stack is a term that you'll hear us toss around quite a bit. Web stack for us generally kind of refers uh, to uh, MVC web pages, uh, web API, and those types of things. The type of things that we ship out of band, right? Uh, where you know web forms doesn't quite fit into the web stack because we don't ship that out of band, right? Yet. Who knows, maybe in the future we can make that happen. So I hope you're all ready because I am going to uh, literally blow your mind. No one laughed at that? Come on, no Star Trek fans? Okay, so all of ASP.NET MVC, ASP.NET Web Pages, and ASP.NET Web API is open source. We just made this announcement a few weeks ago. All of this is now developed in the open, and we take pull requests, right? So if you come to us and you really want an MVC feature, and you've been telling us on user voice, hey, I really want this, I really want this, I really want this, and all of a sudden, you now have the ability to go implement that your feature yourself. You can download the source code, implement that feature, and send us a pull request for that feature, and it might make it into the product. I say might because you know, there's some quality bars in terms of code, you have to have unit tests, you know, we have a whole review process. We have to make sure that the feature actually fits with what we want, the direction we want MVC to go. It's not just, you know, it's not a free for all, but you will be able to do that kind of thing. And these are all available um, on CodePlex. So if I go ahead and open up CodePlex, um, this is a new CodePlex site. They just launched a new redesign actually a couple days ago. So I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it's all available on ASP.NET webstack.codeplex.com. You can actually go in here. Um, you might be saying to yourself, hey, MVC was open source before. What gives? This isn't a big announcement. The big thing here is when we did MVC before, we basically said, okay, we're done with MVC, and we would take a copy of that source code and upload it, right? It wasn't where we currently develop. But if I come in here and I click on source code, provided that the internet goes quick enough, perhaps, maybe. Basically, uh, the point that I was trying to get at, I can click in here, I can view all the, the, the source code files for all this stuff. I can view the dev checking in, right? So I can see every day who's been checking in. Uh, I can see if we've accepted any pull requests, anything like that, right? So it's all open source now, um, which allows you to um, help contribute, helps uh, you do our work for us, which is kind of cool, in my opinion. Uh, so for whatever reason, the style sheet decided not to load, but you can actually see where we're actually developing uh, so things, you know, something was checked in last night at, at uh, uh, 5.41 p.m. Uh, Seattle time. So with that, lastly, let me open up that, and bam, I'm done. 